Hey there, I'm Sully, and welcome to the Gun Club. Alrighty, got several things I want to hit on real quick tonight. I know it's been sort of on and off with streams recently, and I'll apologize for that. Um, actually, I had a really interesting time last weekend. The timeline when I was sort of working on putting a lot of this stuff together for tonight's stream, or for supposed to be last week's stream, ended up... Uh, finding a stream that was a rather two, two and a half hour stream going over a lot of stuff out of a court case with the Maryland ballistics ruling and a lot of interesting stuff there and being interested in the law of forensics, ballistics, and all sorts of stuff like that. Definitely interesting case. If you want to look it up, pretty much they've come up with a lot of questions about how accurate ballistics matching really is. Can you basically say a bullet came from a type of firearm or a specific firearm and a lot of this jives with things that we saw in the Murdoch case things that same came in another thing so definitely was an interesting stream and ended up instead of getting a lot productive done put together for a stream ended up spending more time sitting there making notes about another stream but we'll talk about that one of these days maybe I'll cover some of that on this channel don't know uh try not to do stuff that's too overdone already um, one thing I'm going to start with tonight, we're going to talk about a couple of legal concepts. And when I talk legal concepts, we're not going to go hardcore into the law, though we can. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of terms. When I research, when I read up on articles, and I see things that I'm putting together about different shootings, different incidents, occurrences. One of the things I run into is a lot of times I see terms poorly used or misused or incorrectly used or that don't apply. And these terms are actually very important terms to us as defenders, as citizens who wish to protect ourselves with firearms. And the other side of the coin, we see the media using them wrongly and blaming these situations wrongly for shootings. And two of the ones that I see a lot are the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground Laws. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what the Castle Doctrine actually means generically and stand your ground laws mean generically. Now, we've got 50 states and they have 50 sets of self-defense laws. A lot of it is very common and very similar. Um, Coca-Cola is pretty much the same Coca-Cola you might buy in North Carolina as South Carolina as Georgia, but you may get slightly differences in the flavor depending on how it's sold in, say, Mexico or Taiwan. Self-defense law is a lot like that also. A lot of it is very, very similar that we'll see, but not always identical. And so, therefore, it's really important that you know the law is not only the state you live, but states you frequent. There's a lot of great references out there. One of my personal favorites, I use the USCCA. Um, a couple of years ago, I was going to fly out to Las Vegas and drive a vehicle home, helping a friend of mine out, bringing not only the vehicle back here to South Carolina, but also her dog as well, to ride with me back to South Carolina. So, hey, okay. I looked at what states I'd likely be in between landing in Las Vegas and driving back because I wasn't planning on making the drive from Las Vegas to Greenville, South Carolina, unarmed. I mean, I'm crazy, but I ain't stupid. So, because of the fact that I'd be alone on the road, in strange places, at all hours of the day and night driving, I was going to be carrying, and I wanted to know what the laws were, not only what I could carry, any mag limit requirements, anything like that to keep myself out of you know, trouble, and I also right, looked over the different legal use of force laws to make sure there wasn't anything that was crazy in some state, like you had to warn them twice before discharging or whatever the case may be. So I've briefed myself for interstate travel. That's always a good thing to do. Know the laws where you live, know the laws where you travel. Again, every state's a little bit different. Um, personally, as far as knowing them where I live, my favorite re reference and resource I use, I get from uh, dear old Andrew Branca, Law of Self-Defense. There is the you know state-by-state -state supplement that you can get on DVD so you can research specific cases, specific state laws,
to make sure that not only do you survive the encounter, but you survive the aftermath. Things like that kind of important to me. I don't really think orange is my color, and I'm not planning on going to be, you know, prison pretty for anyone else. So let's talk about these laws, the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground laws. Then we're going to get into a couple of incident reports uh, from around the country. And I've got a couple of good guy, a good girl with a gun cases, and a few little tidbits on the end. Now, when we talk about the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground laws, okay. I'm going to backpedal before we do that and look at the foundation of basic self-defense law. Generic, again, not in-depth. We're not going to go state by state. If you want to go state by state, again, a lot of places you can reference it. I'm South Carolina instructor, so I've got very familiar with copies of it. I can get copies of those and put them up on screen for you. If you have a question about a specific state, throw it up in the chat. Let me know, hey, look, can you give a specific on this, and I'll try to look it up for you best I can. Um, but when we talk about the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground, we have to sort of preface it by when are you generically, generically as applies to most of the states, allowed to use deadly force, okay? We're in a self-defense situation. Someone has done something, and what do I have to prove or display or show in court? to prove that my use of force, deadly force in this case, was justified. Now, law of self-defense, again, throw Andrew Bronco's name out here. He does this so much better than I do, and I'm not trying to steal his shit for a moment. I get this from him. I watch a lot of his videos. If you go to his website over there, lawofselfdefense.com, you can learn so much more from him. And again, he is an attorney. Um, one of the national nationwide experts on self-defense, and he actually is a, able to help attorneys all throughout the country in use of force claims. So he's pretty much my use of force guru that I watch, that I get my brain fillings from. That's where I fill up my tank to be able to vomit this stuff out for y'all. Um, now, based on this, we have five things I need to sort of display in a self-defense claim. If I'm claiming, yes, I shot him. I shot him in self-defense, or I shot her. I shot her in self-defense. Well, what do I have to be able to demonstrate? Or what do I have to be able to prove? Innocence. That I was innocent in the problem. I wasn't doing something wrong. I wasn't the problem child here. I wasn't the one who was starting a fight, picking a fight, instigating a fight. Even if I'm instigating a fight that's not a deadly force threat, saying, oh, I dare you, go ahead and hit me, knowing that I have a firearm, so therefore, oh, well, he attacked me. Yeah, why don't you walk over here a little closer with that knife? Why don't you walk a little closer with that bat? Trying to bait someone into a fight. Now, no good. I've got to be the innocent one. They've got to be the instigator or the provoker. Secondly, imminence. The threat to me has to be imminent. If somebody is standing the other side of a football field, say, or I'm at a softball game and someone's the other side of a fence and they tell me, oh, I'm going to come over there and beat your butt. Well, if they're 25 feet away from me, the other side of a chain link fence, probably not much of an imminent threat. Now, if they're 25 feet away, the other side of the fence with a firearm, different story. But if someone's 25, 35 feet away and they say, yeah, I'm going to come up there with this baseball bat. Well, 35 feet away, number one, probably don't suggest trying to squeeze off around at 35 feet. Number two, 35 feet away, if unless they're starting to move towards you or do something else, it doesn't seem to be an imminent threat. If I'm in an argument with someone and they say, well, I'm going to go home and I'm going to get a knife and I'm going to come back here. Does that seem like an imminent threat to my life that would justify me using deadly force and taking a life? No. There's no imminent threat. Now, if they say, I'm walking right there to my car to get a gun, and they reach in their car, different story. So again, I've got to be innocent. The threat to me must be imminent. My response must be proportional. When we say proportional, again, I'm using deadly force. 
So we talk about lethal force encounters. Do they have a gun, a knife? Yeah. Um, let's say it's a five foot one hundred pound female, and I'm six foot two, two hundred and eighty five pounds. And this five foot one female comes over and she said, "Well, I'm going to smack you," and she open hand slaps me across the face. Would that justify me exercising deadly force? Probably not. I'd have a real hard time justifying to a reasonable and prudent person that that was a threat likely to cause me serious physical injury or death. Now, on the other side of that coin, if I become enraged at her open hand slap and I then begin pummeling her with closed fists, looking at my size versus hers, and I am striking her in the head with closed fists, would she then potentially be? proportional response with deadly force. She'd have a much easier case to make than I would. However, was she innocent in starting the confrontation? If she initiated the confrontation, she may have lost that innocence to a degree because, you know, even though she didn't start the deadly force account, if she was the instigator or the provoker in the fight, she may have more trouble proving that. That's why we always say, you know, don't have none, won't be none. The best gunfight is the one you don't have. The best battle is the one you walk away from. Again, reasonableness. What was reasonable and what would the reasonable and prudent person do? Again, somebody standing on the opposite side of a football field saying, oh, I'm going to come over there at halftime and beat you up. Probably not reasonable for me to say that, yeah, I'm going to, feel threatened by that person at that time. Now, if at halftime they're halfway across the field or charging up into the bleachers, that would be a different story. The last part of this whole little five-tier thing is avoidance. Now, avoidance is really interesting here, and we're going to get into avoidance more in a second. But as a general rule of thumb, if you've used lethal force or used force in self-defense, you need to sort of say, yes, it's self-defense. And you're going to say, I was innocent. The threat was imminent. My response was proportional and reasonable. Now, avoidance. This is where we get into the castle doctrine and or stand your ground. Avoidance is the fifth tier in some cases. However, in some cases, some situations, avoidance is sort of wiped off there. Avoidance is also known in some states as the duty to retreat. For example, the concept says that prior to using deadly force to defend yourself, you have a duty to retreat. Now, you only have that duty to retreat if you can do so with what they say, absolute safety. So let's say I'm getting out of my car, walking into the grocery store. Somebody comes charging towards me, says that I cut them off in traffic. And they're at full rant. Well, if there is a duty to retreat, as there is in about 10, 12 states, I would have to, regardless of what this person did, if they didn't grab onto me, let's say they're coming charging toward me and they have a knife, I would be required to back up. Now, if they were much faster than me, much quicker than me, then, well, I was unable to avoid But if I was able to avoid the situation or remove myself from the situation, I would have a duty to at least try to avoid it prior to exercising deadly force if I'm in an avoidance state. Well, some states have come up with what we call stand your ground or castle doctrine. And this is where this sort of fits in. In some settings, these will eliminate your duty to retreat or your need to retreat. Now, That being said, that's on a legal concept, and it varies slightly state by state. Ideally, the best gunfight, again, is the one that you do avoid, the one that you do walk away from, the one that you don't have. So, in the hypothetical, you're going into the grocery store. Someone comes up and says, you know, you cut me off a half mile back up the road. You said, look, I'm sorry. They say, you know, sorry is not good enough. They start pulling out a knife or a weapon. If you can back away from them safely, I'm not saying you run across a highway. I'm not saying that you run into traffic or put yourself at further risk. 
if they produce a firearm, of course, running at that point wouldn't do you a lot of good. They can shoot you in the back. But again, the situation that you were able to withdraw from, look, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. I can say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 15 million times as I back away from someone. If that de-escalates the situation, fantastic. Now, I know there are some people who don't like that concept. They don't jive with that. They say, well, why should I have to apologize for something I didn't do? Why shouldn't? Okay. Why did we go to the grocery store to begin with? Well, we went to the grocery store because the wife of the girlfriend sent us there to get hamburger buns and ice cream for dinner for the 4th of July cookout we're having. They didn't send you there to get in a gunfight. They didn't send you there to get into a lethal force encounter, to discharge a weapon, to have the police there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, again, surviving the gunfight is great. Surviving the aftermath is a whole other story. The best confrontation is the one you don't have. So if I can de-escalate, walk away, no, 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 no. Even though I may know that physically I could easily take that person hands-on I may have an option. I may have OC spray or something similar with me. If they escalate to a knife, I can escalate to deadly force. I know I'm justified if I have to do it as a last resort. And I know that by the law, I can stand my ground. But even if that's the law and that's wonderful and that's fantastic, it's not a good day. You know, having to fire at someone is not a good day. You don't, you don't want to do that, hopefully. <clears throat> the castle doctrine is largely built around your home. Now, when we talk about the castle doctrine, I've got South Carolina's here, and it's an abbreviated version of it. Again, I can pull the full state law up on the screen. But castle doctrine is based on the concept that your home is your castle. This can include a home. This can include an occupied vehicle that you're in, or even your place of business, your workplace. Beyond that, the stand your ground law gives you the castle doctrine in any place that you have a lawful right to be, as long as you're, this is a big one, not engaged in unlawful activity. So, the castle doctrine says that if somebody forcefully enters your residence, your dwelling, your home, again, forcefully and illegally enters your residence, you don't have to worry about avoidance. You don't have to retreat to the back bedroom. Now, while you may retreat away from the door that's being smashed in or flying glass, it's not saying you can't. It is saying you don't have a duty to avoid a confrontation. If you're out working on your car and someone comes up, you don't necessarily have to avoid a confrontation with them when you're at your home, your castle, within the four walls, and the curtilage. Now, the curtilage is typically an old English term, the area immediately around the house. Look at the, the driveway, an attached garage, an attached carport, the front stoop, the back porch. You know, depending on how your state law looks at it in case law, it may even include a detached garage, a back barn, a shed, whatever. But you don't have a duty to retreat. You also, again, in an occupied vehicle, somebody comes up, again, they're pounding on the outside of the vehicle. Okay, is that an imminent threat of bodily harm to me? No. They're kicking the door of my vehicle, putting a big dent in it. That's a body shop issue. That is not anything that's going to put me in fear of death or great bodily harm. Now, they start smashing out the window. Well, that now has got me in fear of Serious injury or bodily harm? Yes. If they're trying to open the door to get to me. And this is where we can get in some real interesting discussions about what if. You know, someone's out protesting, rioting, demonstrating, whatever we want to call it. They're pounding on the hood of your car with a hammer. They're not a deadly force issue at that point to you. They're pounding with that same hammer on the window, breaking the window. Now they're trying to get to you. They're trying to gain entry to the vehicle. They're trying the door handle. They are trying to get to you. That has escalated from property damage to the hood to a threat to your safety. 
you don't have to retreat and surrender your car. You don't have to retreat in your stand your ground states to avoid the confrontation. So again, ideally, I would retreat if at all possible, just because of the fact that's better than getting involved in the shooting. However, you do not have to. And so when we talk about castle doctrine, that resides, that's based on within the four walls of your home, the immediate area surrounding it. The Stand Your Ground Act goes into any place that you have a right to be. So again, you're in the parking lot of the local grocery store. While you have a legal right to be there, you're not engaged in any illegal activity, you're not out you know, dealing drugs or, you know, um, doing anything illegal, you've got a legal right to be there. You have a legal right to go shopping, and the law recognizes that. So therefore, if someone does come up as you're walking into the store, waving a knife at you, you don't have a duty to necessarily run away from them to avoid the lethal force encounter. So when we look at stand your ground laws, stand your ground is typically outside somewhere in a public area that you've got a right to be. Maybe it's in a restaurant, somewhere else, a public park. You're out there having fun with your friends in a public park. For some reason, a deranged individual comes over and starts swinging at you and your friends and family in your picnic basket with a softball bat. Stranger things have been known to happen. You don't have a duty to retreat and cede ground to this person. Now, if you can get out of that situation or avoid it, that's the ideal. That's what we want to see. But you don't necessarily have a legal duty to do so. It eliminates that duty to retreat or avoid. A lot of this comes up when we talk about shootings that happen. People pounding on the front door. And I also mentioned, I'm going to backtrack a little bit into the castle doctrine. I said someone forcefully entering. Why? Well, if your door is unlocked, you can have the innocent intruder. The neighbor's kid came home drunk and went into the wrong house. Some mentally disturbed person thinks that he lives at your house and accidentally wandered in. No aggression means you no harm. He thinks is at his home. He doesn't know. He wanders around the neighborhood sometimes, and he thought your house was his today. Lawful but awful, we don't want to shoot that person. We don't want to end that person's life for an innocent mistake. You know, the repairman goes to the wrong house and has been told, oh, I'll leave the back door open for you so you can come in and... Uh, check on the cable TV or check on the internet. Well, guess what? 122 Smith Street, he read it as Smythe Street, went to the wrong address, and now he's just walked in the back door of your house. He's wearing his charter cable uniform. He's got his little ID badge and everything else. There's a note here that the resident said, if he's out, please go through the back door. I'll leave it unlocked when I go to pick up the kids at school. Well, unfortunately, you hear someone come in the house, someone moving around. Okay, if he did not forcibly enter the house, now, if the door is locked and he breaks his way in, if the door is locked and lock is damaged, then that's forcible entry. That removes any doubt that their intentions are innocent. So if they forcibly broken in, definitely would be a castle doctrine situation whereby you do not have to retreat. You can engage that person and meet them head on with force. Again, a lot of this stuff is legals. Now, how about if it's someone pounding on the door? Well, if they're outside the door and you're inside the door, short of looking through the window and seeing them having a pew-pew in their hand, chances are they're not an imminent threat to you at any level. Well, they're trying the door. Well, I'm going to announce, I'm going to let them know point blank, they need to back up, they need to back up. Now, if that door starts to give, or they start to breach that door, or they break that glass, 
they've made a very bad decision. That's all I'm going to say. However, ideally, we do what we can to not get to that point. Again, the best shooting is the one you don't have. And again, going over this stuff with the whole innocence, eminence, proportionality, reasonableness, and avoidance, I can quote it all day long. Honestly, that's where you need to touch base with and go check out the videos on uh, YouTube, Rumble, Law of Self-Defense. Uh, Mr. Bronco explains this stuff really well, and you can definitely learn a hell of a lot from his channel. Got to give him all the credit in the world because I've learned a hell of a lot from watching him, and I definitely include a lot of it into my classes. I mean, let's face it, the man actually wrote the book on the law of self-defense, so we'll go with that. All righty. Onwards and upwards. We've talked about where some of this castle doctrine and stand your ground fit in and what it really means. Well, why is it important to us? Well, you hear about some tragic shooting that happens somewhere where someone does something dumb. They get in a shooting at a bar when everybody's drunk and a politician or a media personality says, well, that's why our state, our state needs to get rid of these damn stand your ground laws. If it's mutual combat with guns and everyone's drunk, chances are that's not going to be a self-defense stand your ground situation. You know, again, they're taking this thing they've heard of, oh, this doctrine stand your ground is a bad thing. Well, guess what? Not necessarily, you know, let's talk about real talk here. Let's not go that way. All righty, onwards and upwards. I want to touch base real quickly. If you want to follow in and get more information on any of the stuff we've covered in here, by all means, you can check us out on Twitter, Facebook, our locals community, although I've been a little slack with that of late. Email me. And, of course, if you're not watching this on Rumble, check out our Rumble channel. We have a lot of stuff on Rumble that we put out there. Sometimes Rumble actually gets more video production to it than YouTube does just because of YouTube being a little bit gun sensitive about some of the stuff we talk about. So yeah, if you're seeing this on YouTube, hey, check out where Rumble has the rest of the stuff. Again, I try to respect YouTube's community guidelines as much as I can, and if they don't want all of our stuff there, I won't put all my stuff there. I'll pop it over to Rumble. Now, onwards and upwards, we've got a couple of incidents I want to cover here. And I didn't do deep dives on these with slides, but I did sort of touch base on them. And we've got sort of a really, really interesting situation. Um, first one I have comes out of Boston, Massachusetts. It's actually Newton, Mass. And this happened about a week or so ago, Sunday morning. Um, actually, about probably two weeks ago now. A couple who is 73 and 74 years of age and her mother, who was 97, don't show up to church. They always showed up to church. Well, everyone got worried. I mean, these people were very active in the church. So someone sent someone to go check on them, make sure they're okay. They had broken down. Nothing had happened. They were all found deceased in the home. Stabbed and brutally beaten. I think they said the wife had something like 30-something stab wounds. Um, it turned out the suspect is a 41-year-old male, lives in the area. He does have a long history of mental illness, mental health issues. Um, he, at the time, had lived with his sister, but had lived around the area, wandered around the area. This 41-year-old male apparently broke in through a window and stabbed and brutally beat these three individuals to death age 73, 74, and 97. Now, I know this isn't a gun thing. It's got really no guns in it. You know. First of all, I bring this up because, A, evil exists. Tell me it doesn't. I can prove you wrong a thousand out of a thousand times. B, this gentleman had no connection, no known motive, no nothing with these victims, totally unknown. Um, the gentleman had had previous run-ins with law enforcement, nothing really bad criminal than what I found. However, again, no mental health issues. The sister he stayed with talked about all his 
ongoing drama with mental health and the lack of mental health care. When we talk about a lot of these things, you know, Massachusetts just passed and is working on passing and putting into place one of the most restrictive firearms laws and sets of laws, batches of laws, gaggles of laws in the country. But yet, none of those firearms laws, <coughs> none of those restrictions, prohibitions, or anything else will do anything to bring this family back. There is not a firearms law that would have prevented this shit show from going on. So I have a little bit of a bite there because... Again, we preach, and those of y'all in the 2A community know, gun control laws only affect those individuals who choose to obey the law. That speed limit sign on the side of the road says 50 miles an hour does not make you go 50 miles an hour. It just means that that's what the state or the city wants you to do, and so therefore you can be penalized for breaking it. Well, gun control laws, gun-free zones, all this stuff, it doesn't stop the guns from getting there. It doesn't stop the violence from happening. It doesn't stop this 41-year-old mentally ill male from breaking into someone's house, most likely under cover of darkness, and brutally murdering three human beings. My question is, If those human beings had been in a situation where they were better prepared to protect themselves, because again, 73, 74 years old, how well will you do suddenly woke up in the middle of the night, your spouse is screaming, and you've got a 41-year-old mentally ill individual stabbing and beating them? You know, again, this tragic situation, this couple should not have lost their life, her mother should not have lost her life. And I would hate to see that the 41-year-old end up losing his life, but I can live with that a little bit better than these three people being brutally slaughtered in a state that made it virtually impossible for them to defend themselves. You know, if you personally don't want firearms in the house, that's a choice you're making. If you personally don't want to have a fire extinguisher in your kitchen, That's a choice you're making. If your house catches fire and the fire extinguisher would have helped, you can play that back in your mind. But if the state makes it so difficult, cost prohibitive, go through paperwork, paperwork prohibitive, to be able to get that fire extinguisher that may save you or your family's life, I have a problem with that. And I think we need to realize You know, everyone says, oh, with the crime up, we need to control guns. No, we need to control criminals. Controlling guns ain't going to do no good because criminals don't listen to gun laws. They don't listen to any laws. That's in the definition of criminal. So I saw this come across, and it was tragic, and it's like, okay. And then within days of it, Massachusetts is passing more restrictive gun laws. Well, you know. Now, they didn't cite this for the gun laws and those were already in the works, but guess what? Folks, it doesn't work that way. Let's go to the next one. This is interesting. New York City subway. Again, happened about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Three women randomly slashed on New York City subway trains in a span of 20 to 30 minutes. It began on the number four train. Woman's on the subway. She sees this man staring at her, acting weird, acting bizarre. It bothers her. So she gets off the next stop. She figures she'll walk, she'll take a cab, she'll take a bus, she'll do something. That guy was freaking her out. What she didn't realize is he got off the train also. And as she was walking up the stairs out of the subway station underground, He took out some sort of edged weapon and slashed her across the back of her leg and ran off. Why he did this, we don't know. He took off, went wherever. We don't know. That occurred at uh, the number four train. 
uh, shortly after that at Lexington Avenue and 86th Street Station. Another female slashed on the leg from behind, totally unaware of anything, hadn't even seen it coming. This man slashed her for whatever reason. Shortly after that, at the Brooklyn Bridge City Hall Station, another woman gets slashed. Didn't see it coming, nothing. Now, why do I bring this up again? I don't, I don't see a gun here. There's a gun club, but okay. Congratulations. New York City is a gun-free, well, New York City subway is a gun-free zone. You have a gentleman walking around indiscriminately, slashing not one. No, he just kept on going. I slashed her, slashed her, slashed her, slashed multiple women with basically impunity. Still had his weapon and was going off to do it again. Uh, turns out our suspect is a 28-year-old male. He was taken into custody by Transit PD. Um, they were able to track back on video, get a description of him. He's five foot eight, two twenty-five. Now, the New York City subways have gotten sort of an interesting reputation recently. I'm sure we all heard of the Daniel Penny Jordan Neely case. We heard of the subsequent case with the stabbing, where all the charges have recently been dismissed on that other case. And then we hear this. This gentleman um, has been previously arrested in 2011 for criminal uh, mischief, 2012 for assault three and attempted rape, 2016 for forcible touching, also has a possible mental health history per the family, and was actually seen on the day of the stabbings and cuttings, jumping the turnstile to get into the subway instead of paying his tokens or his MTA card to get in. Sorry, when I was up there, it was tokens. I get little fancy cards now. So the subway, that in an effort to make things safe, because we're going to make it safe, says, no, no guns, no gun-free, you know, totally gun-free zone because it's going to be safe. That in the course of the last year, I think it's had 20-something people pushed in front of trains. Yeah, getting pushed in front of a train or getting pushed on the tracks, electrified rails and stuff, bad days. But meanwhile, we're going to make it safe. Because those law-abiding citizens can't let them carry their firearms. Does it stop the bad guys from carrying weapons? No. Has it stopped anyone from carrying edged weapons? No. Do any of these rules stop this guy from going around indiscriminately slashing women from behind? Ladies, next time you're in a crowd or a crowd of people going up a flight of stairs, think what you'd do if you caught a razor blade across the back of your knee. There's an artery back there, by the way. Think of what would happen. This is what we're going on. Again, mental health issues, yes, check. Previous arrests, check. Multiple previous arrests, attempted rape, forcible touching, assault three. Yeah, not typically the most upstanding member of the community. So there's his little, you know, statistics, his vital stat sheet. In and out of the revolving door, the city is not protecting anyone but they're going to pass a law that if a law-abiding citizen wants to ride the subway, they need to be disarmed. Criminals prefer unarmed victims. They really do. And I'm not saying that I'm not really positive on everybody spraying and praying in the subway because, you know, I know bullets ricochet. I know what tile walls are. I get it. On the other side of that coin, why do we have this keep going on? That's, you know, again, food for thought. Ponder, consider, think about it. How do we stop this? I think mental health is one. I think aggressive prosecution of this crap is another. Now, moving forward, we have another little way to stop some things. And that's a good guy with a gun. Unfortunately, it's really, really hard to make that all make a connection in New York City. But we'll see what we can do in other areas. Now, I found this case, and it's an older case. It's from August of 2022. But I thought it was a really, really interesting case when I was looking at all the self-defense law stuff. A woman shoots her husband during a domestic assault. Woman comes home from visiting her friend. Husband begins arguing. She tried to defuse or de-escalate the situation. 
He became enraged, throws her on the floor. Oh, wow, I spelled that wrong. Throws her on the floor, and gets on top of her, and is shaking her violently. So, he's not using deadly force. I mean, you wouldn't think there's no weapon, there's no gun, there's no knife. But his size and strength can that present serious bodily injury or death to her. She's pinned on the floor. He's violently shaking her. She draws her pistol and shoots him in the leg. What she was aiming for, we don't know, folks. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up some days. On the other side of that coin, you know, when we look at, you know, her drawing a pistol, puts around in his leg. I guess he's lucky that she, like, didn't hit something else. And no charges against her. However, after the hubby got out of the hospital, he was arrested. So, again, when we look at your deadly force criteria, look, definitely fits. <laughs> Death, great bodily harm. Was she innocent? Pretty much, yes. Did she feel there was imminence? Yes. Was her response proportional? Being pinned on the ground, violently throttled? Yes. So, boom. There's your deadly force criteria. Now, this next one's kind of cool. Before we get into that, Good evening, Mr. Uh, Sleazy89. I see you in the chat. Having a wonderful day on this end. Uh, hope you're enjoying the show. I uh, see we've got a few people. Please go down, pound the little rumble button, share the show out. We're trying to build the channel up. We've been sitting at right around 195, 196 people so far following the channel. Hopefully get it up a little bit more. Um got some real interesting stuff coming up uh, next week. I've actually got a gentleman who does um, ammunition manufacturing. He's going to be coming on. We're going to be doing probably, I think he's coming up next week, and we're going to be talking about ammunition, ammunition manufacturing, and his company's bullets and how they make their stuff and why it's better and different and wonderful. I haven't uh, had a chance to sample any of their goodies yet, but from their website, I looked at it. It was definitely kind of interesting. So we may get into a really cool chat about ballistics and fun stuff with that. And <coughs> get into some terminal ballistics and things like that. So could be interesting. Um, moving onwards and upwards. This is a real interesting case for our good guy with the gun section. If you didn't hear about it, Las Vegas, Nevada, about a week ago. 32-year-old man armed with a rifle attacks a condo complex. 32-year-old, he actually lived in the complex. He lived there, went outside, armed with an AR, and then proceeded to come storming back into the lobby of the complex, blowing out windows as he goes, actually puts a shot into the lobby, then takes aim at a security guard or security officer on scene, Rifle jams, malfunctions at some point. And at that point, an armed employee fires multiple shots from his Smith & Wesson carry pistol. Now, the armed employee was not a armed officer, an armed security person. It was, you know, they say possibly someone from the receiving office downstairs who just happened to carry at work. He was not there to be armed or to be a protector or a defender for that facility. However, did he protect? Did he defend? Yes. Um, the initial shooter has been arrested again after the hospital. The employee hasn't been charged. Now, the crazy thing is, this has all the makings. We have an armed man with an assault rifle. Yeah, it was an AR, whatever. It was an AR platform rifle from what I read. Goes storming into, tries to shoot security. But yet, it's not made national news. And chances are, if you weren't around the Vegas area, you didn't hear too much about it. The threat was stopped by an armed citizen with a firearm. Interesting, the security there was unarmed. And one of the guys happened to be armed who worked in receiving or something. Again, a lot of conflicting reports, but they actually, several residents of the condo complex credit this gentleman with saving lives that day. 
both in the front office and everything else. I'm going to be trying to look at doing more of a deep dive of this as more information comes out. I just thought it was so interesting. When we hear about the Las Vegas mass shooter, we all know about the one that went bad, that went horrifically bad out on Route 1. The thing we don't hear about is stuff like this. We're an armed citizen with a Smith & Wesson pistol on his belt stopped the guy with the AR platform rifle. I think it's also important to look at this for another reason. You know, the more Congress and the more different legislative bodies try to dig in and AR rifles are bad, they're mass killing machines, they're this, this, this. No, they're not. They're very effective rifles. They're good rifles. I like my ARs. But an idiot with an AR can be put down by somebody with a standard sidearm. Imagine that. Really interesting at that point. Now, to go with another one. It sort of fits the same thing. This one's out of Houston, Texas. Somebody messed with the mama bear. Woman pulls in front of a convenience store. She's there to drop off food for her husband. He's working at the store. Two armed men get out of an SUV. The woman's husband comes outside. One of the armed men is apparently carrying what appeared to be an AR platform weapon. The other one actually begins pistol whipping the husband. Basically, don't know exactly how it started. Again, three or four different stories. However, the wife of the man watching her husband get pistol whipped She draws from concealed carry, hers. She's nine months pregnant. Mama Bear said, you ain't doing that, my baby daddy. And she ends up shooting the bad guy. This gives the husband enough time where he's able to draw his concealed carry gun. And he and the wife hold bad guy at gunpoint until the police arrive. The other bad guy takes off and they're still looking for him. Again, you think, why is she bringing him food at work? So I'm sure he could have ordered Uber Eats or DoorDash or whatever. Probably saved money. She's pregnant. He's working. They're doing everything right as far as trying to live the normal life. You know, husband, wife, pregnant. He's working, everything else. And two idiots decide that they're going to either rob her, flex on her, pistol whip him, all this stuff. And then, you know, she ends up shooting one of them. Um, The man did go to the hospital. He did survive. The other one, again, they're looking for him. It's just so interesting here. Again, Mama Bear fights off. One more time, folks. You know, two out of my three today were actually ladies doing the shooting. Gentlemen, train your ladies to shoot. If you can't, you don't want to, whatever, get them in a class, get them trained. Again, size and strength being what it is, you know, you're more likely to be seen as a threat than they are. And, you know, it's often told somebody was asking one time about, do you think I really need to carry a gun? And it was a female, very attractive, intelligent young lady. And I looked at her and I said, honestly, dear, if you and I are both walking out of the same grocery store at the same time at night and you go one way to your car and I go the other way and there's a bad guy in the parking lot, which one of us is he going to pick to engage with or try to rob or try to do something? The six foot two, 280 pound guy, or the uh, five foot three model hot female who's about 110 pounds soaking wet with rocks in her pockets. Yeah. But nine months pregnant, she fights him off. Put one on the ground and one in the wind. Good job, girl. All righty. Quick update on the pistol brace drama. Now, We had talked about it last time I did this. The House Resolution 44 Congressional Review Act 
basically trying to put the screeching brakes on the ATF's over um, reaching with the pistol braces. It had passed the House of Representatives and still needed to pass the Senate. However, bad news, it did not pass the Senate. It failed in a 50 to 49 vote split across the party line. Sadly, um, Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema both voted in the 50, as did all the Democrats, 49 with the Republicans. Had it been 50 to 50, Kamala Harris would have been the tiebreaker. So we know how that would have gone. So we need to at least not only not get to a tie, but get to better than the tie. And again, you know, the president had said he'd veto it, so don't know. On the other side, there have been multiple lawsuits still pending in multiple circuits. I think we may get some relief there. You know, whether it's Second Amendment Foundation, whether it's GOA, all these you know, keep up with what over gun organizations you do. Read their mailers. Try to do what you can to help them out, to throw them a little change these days because, you know, they need it. They're actually really fighting for us now. And so hopefully, again, these cases, the, you know, lawsuits are still pending. So let's see what we can do, get some positive out of that. All righty, that is about all I've got running for tonight. Uh, Again, we're working on trying to add some more content. Hopefully, we're going to be posting up a schedule. I've got a Surviving the Streets class coming up. I'm looking at trying to put some information up here from that. If you have any questions, again, it's mike.southeastdefense at gmail.com. I usually follow up on you pretty quickly. Again, next week, looking at having a gentleman in who does custom ammunition manufacturing, ammunition design stuff. I don't know. I'm kind of fascinated by it. Uh, I do know the basics of hand loading and reloading bullets. However, you know, this again, being someone who's built a company of manufacturing ammo, I think it would be someone interesting to talk to when we could talk and learn a little bit more about what is the ammo side of these tools we use beyond that be good be safe be smart bye